And so maybe someone looking uh, from an outside perspective saying, well, I don't have the skills or I don't have the ability to do something like I was I was making cocktails and pouring beer and driving for Lyft. What were your first thoughts or your first action like once you got the news like and you came to the office or you started working? I don't know. Like it's it's so so weird. I don't, I don't even know. Like you know, it's like it's like COVID. You know, like one day you're just in lockdown. <laughs> you, you really want to know what my first thoughts were? Yeah. Pay me more. <laughs> um, and it was met with a little bit of resistance um, because I think uh, what I had thought, my impression was, you had three people doing three jobs. Now you want one person to do three jobs. And so I felt like if you were going to ask one person to do three jobs, then you need to compensate me more. And, and what they quickly said was, we're not expecting you to do three jobs. We're moving the scope of the role back so that you can do a little bit more, but certainly not take over three jobs. So um, my initial thought was, uh, you know, oh, oh, God, what have I gotten myself into here? Or more, what are they going to put on me? But they quickly set expectations that that's not what, uh, what they wanted to do. So, and then after that, it was, you know, after the initial shock, it was letting, letting our vendors know that this was how we were going to be, be moving forward. And then just, uh, trying to, to gather as much information and, um, get comfortable as quickly as I, as I could. Um, So yeah, over the over the next few weeks and months after that, it was you know definitely a tough transition period. But eventually, I was able to to settle in and, and make it work in a way that didn't push me too far. But uh, you know, at the same time, a, a, a one person localization program, it was a lot of work. It was it was a lot of work to to oversee what I did. But you know, I, we still were able to launch and maintain um, a handful of languages, uh, particularly on the website. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's one of those things where it was a business decision, but it is what it is and, and we made it work. What was the biggest challenge for you, let's say, during the first, I don't know, month or three months? Yeah, I would say probably lack of understanding on the technical side. You know, that was something that, that, that Brian was very good at. Um, he, he could code. He understood the, the technical aspect of it. And I, I cannot. Um, I'd say my, my coding experience, uh, goes as far as basic SQL queries, select from where. And that's, that's about it. Um, so, right? You know, um, so it was, it was tough for me to then be thrust into the, the role of, talking to engineers, trying to triage issues with the translation pipeline, with GitHub, with the, the back end of the TMS, um, and not knowing very much about it at all. Um, so I'd say that was probably the biggest growing pain that, that I had. But fortunately for me, um, we had some pretty great engineers that were uh, still at the company because after we, after we initially launched... Uh, Uh, the the localization program at Lyft, they moved a lot of the engineers to other roles to work on other things. And so, even though they were still at the company, they weren't focusing on localization. But uh, there was one guy in particular who took – he had built a lot of the uh, translation pipeline and even though he was working on something else, still felt ownership over it. So, I certainly went to him for a lot of, a lot of questions and he was able to help me along. But that was probably the – The toughest thing in the beginning for me, just getting familiar with any any technical uh, back end issues of the of the the, the TMS and the, and and things like that. Where did you get your like further learning, or how did you educate yourself when you were alone? Because in the beginning, you mentioned that that Brian was like a mentor to you when it comes to localization. So, so where did you learn? Like, did, was it at that point where you started like reaching outside of Lyft and, you know, like going to, I don't know, lock lunches or whatever? Or did you have some meetups, you know, like in Silicon Valley? I assume that there's quite a big of 
people working in localization? Yes. Yeah, so, so there's a, a globalization SF meetup group um, where I went to a handful of events um, there, even helped host an event at Lyft, um, which was a, a really, really great event, a, a great experience. Uh, I went to Loke World in 2018, actually, um, and was able to, to meet some, some, uh, some great people there and attend events. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd say really leveraging LinkedIn and our, our vendors as well. Um, our, our TMS vendor, you know, they, they, they had as part of our contract, we had developer resources. So when I had questions about things, I would try and leverage them and ask them to, to give us insight in it. So yeah, um, a lot of different places. Um, that I was able to to slowly gather the information that I needed from a technical side to to learn, and you know, I still would say I still have a lot to learn, but I certainly know a lot more than uh, than I did at the very beginning. What, what I'm curious is, you know, like once you once you are in position like you were, like suddenly you were running the whole localization, like you're exposed to a lot more things that you need to solve. So I think that's a great way how you can learn just by like trying to figure things out. So how would you like, let's say, balance like learning from your own experience, like trying to troubleshoot your own problems and actually going out and asking for external help, like advisors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I, I think there is something to be said by stumbling through something and really at least taking a stab at trying to solve it yourself um, with with the resources that you have uh, access to, um, that's going to be a lot more painful <laughs> than, than going to someone externally, um, going to your vendor or going to someone, you know, someone also in localization that, uh, you may know from LinkedIn, um, or a localization group, a globalization group that, uh, that you can go to events to, that you, you're able to uh, attend events. So, I think it's a balance between the two. I mean, if you really, if you, if you like pain and discomfort, <laughs> then do it yourself <laughs> and only do it. But I think, I think if you balance between the two of trying something, seeing if you can solve it, seeing what you can learn, uh, off, off the bat. And if, uh, I, I think you'll find that people are able to figure things out. Like if you give it a shot and if you really try, um, you'll be able to get it. And if you, if you end up running into trouble, then, then try and, 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 uh, access your network and get advice from other people. But, uh, yeah, I think give it a shot at first. If you really are having trouble, then really make the connections. And, and that's where, you know, again, uh, you know, I want to come back to it is relationship building, like, especially in localization, like the people that I've met, uh, the, uh, I, I've learned so much from them. I mean, look where I'm sitting right now, like talking to you, like this is, this is through Javi. And like, I met Javi through, so I don't even remember. I think it was my, might've just been LinkedIn and like, and here, and here we are sitting here, you know, sh sharing stories, sharing information, like particularly localization as an industry, like those connections and those relationships, they really come around the job at Netflix. Like I had, done some podcasts uh so, or like with our vendor smartling um and had been on on javi's uh loc loc life um and i got it reached out to by a recruiter for the localization team at netflix and i really f do believe that it's because of the work and connections that i built um and shared publicly that i, I was able to to get this opportunity so you know i just i can't stress enough uh, whether it's from a learning, whether it's from a, uh, a job search uh, perspective, like having those connections is, is crucial. Do you think it's important for people to have a public presence? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I really do. Um, especially in, in localization, because it's such a, a niche industry, it's, it's, it's small. You know, I, I feel like I see the same people like a lot um, because it's not very large. Um, and so I, I think being public and uh, participating in events like this, sharing the information, sharing the knowledge, uh, getting to know people is, is going to lead to growth on a personal and professional level. So 
Absolutely. I think, I think really having that public presence is, is key if you want to move forward and move up. So you, you've been to, to quite a few of these, you know, events, podcasts, shows. What do you think is the most valuable information that you shared so far? Or was, was there anything that you shared or people were like, Oh, Zach, thank you for saying that. Like, did you get any feedback or like in your own perspective, what is the most valuable thing? Honestly, I think probably just the fact that I hadn't worked in tech at all. I had no experience in tech and yet somehow I was able to get my foot in the door and move into the role that I wanted to do. And so maybe someone looking uh, from an outside perspective saying, well, I don't have the skills or I don't have the ability to do something like I was... I was making cocktails and pouring beer and driving for Lyft. That's what I was doing. <laughs> and, and then I, through a series of events, like I was able to, to get my foot in the door and get hired, but I didn't start in localization. I started as an entry level. I was an entry level employee. And then just, just being there, seeing my surroundings, understanding and learning from people around me was able to push my way and move into the role I wanted to be. So, you know, I, I think that's probably the the most valuable thing is like, no matter what your background is, no matter where you're coming from, if you're passionate about something, you put yourself in the right situations and you continue to, to learn and, and, and push forward, you're going to get there. Um, it's going to take a while. You know, like I said, it, it took me four and a half years to get into localization at, at, at Lyft. Like it wasn't something that happened overnight, but I never stopped. I never stopped advocating and never stopped pushing. So I think probably the, the most valuable thing that I, I've shared is like, you can do it no matter, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you're coming from. Like if you, if you want to learn and you have the, the passion for it, you will make it happen. And so. That I think is 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 key. No matter what you're trying to do, localization or otherwise, is just keep pushing forward, and and you can make it happen. Yeah, I think people can push forward if they know what they want. And this reminds me that at the beginning you were saying when we we're talking about your education that you finished the Spanish translations, but you didn't know what you wanted to do. So so then then we, now you we are talking that for four years like it took you to get into localization. So did you at that time like before you got into localization four years back were you already thinking like hey this is what I want to be doing like were you pursuing it or was it more like a I don't know like a life accident that got you into localization or both? Probably both. Um, I, I think it's definitely a, a combination of the two. Uh, again, I didn't fully understand that localization was a thing when I first started working at Lyft. I knew that I wanted to do something with, with language. And localization, the way I like to describe it is this, it's the, this beautiful intersection between language and technology. Um, and so, I was working at a tech company, but I wanted to do language. How was I going to make that happen? And so, when I started on the support team, answering Spanish language emails and phone calls working on operations, managing Chicago, Miami, Atlanta, um, building, um, trying to communicate with Spanish-speaking drivers. I remember for for Miami, we did a pilot where we translated an email every week, about, like a driver email, um, and sent it out and measured engagement on it. This was very, very early on. Um, so, trying to find language projects within the role that I was working on, that's what really drove me eventually to understand that, okay, this is what localization is. This is offering uh, an, an, an experience in another language. So, um, it was very much uh, a planned accident. I don't know if you can, <laughs> if, if that makes sense at all, which it, it sounds like it doesn't um, now that I say it out loud. But no, I think it was... <laughs> It was continuing to do language and translation projects um, here and there. And then eventually it got to the point where why don't we just translate everything and that that's what localization is. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's um, that's how it, it, it ended up, at least in, in, in my perspective, how uh, how it ended up happening for me. 
do you think that the future starts earlier in Silicon Valley? The future? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Does the future start earlier? That's a really good question. I, I like I like the phrasing on that. That's good. That's good. Um, yes. That's it. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, I think uh, with all the tech companies that are based in Silicon Valley, there's going to be innovation that starts there before other places. Um mm-hmm. Can it happen in other, in other places? Of course. But because of the concentration of companies that are focusing on things like self-driving, on AI and machine learning um, that are based in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, you're going to see a lot more innovation come out of here. And I, I think because of those, those companies, you're, you're getting a lot of talent that is drawn here from other parts of the country, from other parts of the world. So that's going to drive different projects, different ideas to be developed more quickly here uh, in, in Silicon Valley. So yes, the future, the future is now and the future is here. <laughs> but would you, would you have moved to Silicon Valley if you were not from California? That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. That's really tough because... I, I've lived my whole life in California. So I, I'm definitely a California born and raised. I've lived all up and down the California coast. Um, I don't know. I've, I've spent uh, almost my entire life on the California coast. Um, so it's tough to say. I like, I, out of all the places I've lived, I like the Bay Area the most. Um, I like it more than Los Angeles. It's very different. It's a very different vibe. But uh, I really do enjoy San Francisco much more than Los Angeles. Los Angeles is massive. There's, you know, the city of Los Angeles is 3 million people. LA County is 10 million people. Um, The Bay Area itself is about 10 million spread out. But San Francisco is less than a million people in the city. And it's this tiny little seven mile by seven mile uh, pinky nail of the pen- of this peninsula, so everything's really close. Um, so I, I, I like it a lot more than than Los Angeles because everything is so spread out down there. But here in San Francisco, everything is very very close together. Mm-hmm. Okay. So speaking about self driving cars and all the future, what are you curious about right now? Hmm. Um, definitely still, you know, even though I moved away into the entertainment uh, tech industry from, from Rideshare, I'm still very curious to see the developments on the, on, on the uh, self-driving, you know, uh, on the streets of San Francisco, I see several different companies uh, that are, ha- uh, have cars on the street, uh, Cruise, uh, which is uh, a self-driving company owned by GM. Um, I see their cars all the time. Waymo, which is owned by Google. I see them all the time. So I think, I think over the next few years, we're definitely going to see a lot of interesting development, um, in terms of cars driving around without people behind the wheel. Now they have safety drivers that, that can take over. But, uh, I believe Waymo has a license to drive, to operate cars without a driver in the driver's seat. Um, so I think we'll start to see that a little bit and a limited, uh, a limited capacity. So I think that's something in the next five years, you're really going to see a few jumps there. Um, what I'm really interested in getting back to localization is machine translation. Now, machine translation has been around for a long time, um, but it has gotten so much better in the last five, six years. I mean, leaps and bounds better. Um, the engines that can be trained, engines that can be uh, improved and that get better as, as time goes on. So I think uh, I'm really curious to see, and there's a handful of companies that are doing this already, of being able to utilize multiple engines um, and able to use um, that, that machine translation to really drive down costs um, and drive up quality, or at the very least have equal quality to humans um, on a first pass with still having a human review but having different engines for different types of content. So you have one engine for legal content, you have one engine for marketing content, and then you really start to understand uh, how you can run a massive program with, with a lot of content very easily because a lot of it's automated. So 
you know, I'm really curious to see what kind of developments come out of there. Um, and just what, what, uh, machine translation has in store for, for all of us, uh, as it, as it gets better and better. I think especially for where you are right now, that's where the machine translation is not, let's say, favorite right now for like creative content, right? Yeah. But do you see it eventually getting there? I do. Um, I don't think that's going to be very soon. Um, I think that'll definitely be quite a few years down the line. Um, and I, I do think that humans will be involved at some point. Um, for for quite a while, um, you know, I, I don't think that's in the in the near term. Um, but what you're going to start to see is for larger um, pieces of content, you'll be able to have a a really fast, quick, dirty, uh, not dirty, but just a, a really fast first pass that will be almost usable, and that you could almost immediately go to market with with this like first pass translation because it'll get to a point that's that's pretty good and then you have a human come in and over the next you know 48 72 hours clean everything up but uh in terms of speed i think you're going to see speed move really fast um the way netflix does it is is they sort of split uh localization into content and product so you've got subtitles dubbing title localization on one side and then the product experience the app the website, uh, TV, like if you have a smart TV, you know, things like that. So I think uh, on the content side, it won't be as, um, it won't be implemented as quickly. But on the product side, I think you'll start to see more first pass machine translation uh, in, the, in the next few years. Right. This, this might be a stupid question. Is for, uh, so, okay, to give you context, like for tech companies, when you have, let's say, knowledge based articles, like, very boring things for some markets the companies might just opt to just machine translate the content because there are not that many people and even if it's like sort of understandable it still helps the people do you think something like this could be used for netflix does netflix let's say prioritize certain markets based on the quality or do they try to treat everyone with the same quality because it's netflix well, I, I think um, for your first question there, I, I do think that it's tough because is is having a piece of localized content in that person's language that's not well localized, is that more valuable than having something that is good quality but is in a language that they don't understand as well? So... I think it's it's going to be really important to to weigh the trade offs between the two. Um, now, as far as choosing which languages to offer, you know, I, I don't think um, yeah, I don't want to be careful with what I say here because I have to, you know. Yeah, of course. I I, I think that there's a lot of metrics that uh, that that Netflix uses for picking which language to go into. Um, you know, Netflix is offered in over 30 languages, but in terms of choosing which subtitles to offer, which dubs to offer, you know, there's, there's a method to the madness. Um, so, you know, not every single title is subtitled in every single language. Um, not, uh, not every single title is, is, has dubs for every single language. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's just a lot of metrics that uh, that are taken into account um, to choose which languages to do. Um, you know, using my my crystal ball, um, which is just my my opinion and my thoughts on it. I, I think down the line there could be some value in offering uh, a lot more languages if machine translation was there, particularly for knowledge based articles, like you said, very dry information educational type articles where the materials very straightforward and doesn't have a lot of idioms uh, or um, marketing type language I think there definitely can be a benefit there to to, uh, to to do that in some of the longer tail languages that aren't as as prevalent so will they do it who knows um, is it something that I think would be beneficial um, if the quality's there why not 
Okay, an- another stupid question. I'm wondering what you can say here. Uh, how do I say this? When is the next season of La Casa de Papel coming out? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that I definitely cannot tell you. <laughs> not a fan. Not a fan. <laughs> not a fan. Oh boy. Ooh, oh boy. We're we're done here. We're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see in the background? See this? Oh yeah, I see. What what is the what is the how do you call it? The pop Popeye? No. Oh, the uh, um, yeah. Uh, that's uh. It's a baseball player for for the Dodgers. That's uh, Cody Bellinger. Um, gosh, what are those called? They're called Papa Papa Pop something F- uh, Funko Pop Funko Pop. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what I what I wanted to speculate on was, I'm not sure if you know like about voice synthesis, like AI that can actually based on some samples create your voice as if you spoke it, but it's just like mm. based on a text. Oh, interesting. Have you heard it? Uh, I think I've heard of that. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's, again, uh, my specific role in Netflix is on the product side. So, I don't do very much with the subtitles or du- or dubbing. Um, but I think it would be, it would be really interesting um, if there was a way to uh, take uh, a, a transcript or a, trans- or a translation and then be able to turn it into dubbing really easily um but that to me sounds really difficult and to be able to capture i mean every piece of content how would you capture the tone that an actor is speaking in just from a piece of text i don't think it's impossible i think there's certainly inputs if you uh if you trained a machine uh with with different tones like angry or sad or crying or surprised to be able to mimic that tone, I think it, it's possible. Uh, I don't think that's coming anytime soon, though. But that's a really interesting idea. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. And it's funny because I even already tried it. There was like one platform for podcast recording where it automatically generates transcript for you. And you can actually edit it as a text. And it actually inserts the voice for the text based on your edits, which is super crazy. Interesting. Yeah. So it, it, it like it hears your voice. Yes. Um, and then is able to insert other words based on what it heard from your voice. Exactly. Wow. That's pretty cool. It's sort of like uh, you know, like when they already make make these movies with 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 actors who already passed away. Mm, right. So that's sort of like a thing, you know. Like maybe at some point you would just I don't know, let's say, do like a SaaS service on your let's say voice or or your model and all the studios would just rent it out and create something artificially. Why not? I mean, that's, you know, like uh, things like that, th- that we don't uh, have too much knowledge into, or we think are impossible. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at Lyft and Uber 10 years ago, they basically didn't exist. Mm-hmm. And now can you imagine a system or a world without, without those services? Like, they're so ingrained in people's daily lives that you know it's just it's a way of life now. So ten years from now, th- that could be the way things are going. So you know, nothing is impossible. It's good that you went back to Lyft and Uber because I was trying to find a way how to go back to that because I like when you were mentioning the self-driving cars. So how do you actually think like this would affect their business? at some point like do you think they would own the self-driving cars and just provide the service without the drivers uh lyft has a whole branch of their company um and this is all all public they have a public website it's called level five um and they're developing the self-driving software um so the the software that goes in the car that uh that the car uses in order to get around so I think Lyft, uh, Lyft is definitely hedging their bet and trying to move towards a world where they have an open source solution that multiple companies that want to use or have like companies that that manufacture cars that want to have self driving a uh, self driving service they're able to use Lyft's open platform self driving software. Um, it's interesting. Uber just uh, sold off or or spun off its uh, self driving unit. Um, I think, I think they might have sold it. Um, I think they did actually. 
to a, a, to another self driving company. So you know, I I think there's going to be hardware and software. I I think there's not going to be a lot of overlap. Although you look at Tesla, they're trying to do both. Um, so so I think they're going to be one one company that that does both. But I think the vast majority of players you're going to see hardware and software be separate and then and then come together with with partnerships going back to your role and a little bit of localization although we kind of like left it behind how do you think like like ai will affect project management that's what you're doing and a lot of i, I don't know maybe you can even like briefly tell us what exactly is that you do let's say on a day-to-day -day basis because like a lot of the people are saying especially the people who are um pushing for internationalization and continuous localization you know that there's once you have the process figured out there's not that much space for project managers or at least the 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 way that people think about project management in the old way like you get files and you send them to translators and you write a lot of emails like all of this can be automated yeah so a little bit more specifically about about what i do I sit on the product side, so I focus um, specifically, there's a lot of different components, but the components that I focus on are mobile and, and web for the most part. So uh, any strings that have to do with Netflix.com, the, the web experience, or the Android or, or iOS um, mobile apps. So most of what I do is facilitating um, QC um, so making sure there aren't any issues with tests that engineers are running. So let's say an engineer wants to test a new feature. They have a lot of different cells. They're called different experiences. So like cell number one is control. Cell number two has the button on the right side. Cell number three has the button on the left side. Cell number four, the button says a different piece of text here. And then they want to see which one performs the best to drive different metrics. Now, um, not only are they testing this in English, they need to make sure that these are localized and are testing in other languages as well. So once the feature is ready to be tested, then they'll send it to me with, with visual context to be able to send that out to localization testers to flag linguistic or non-linguistic issues. So linguistic could be a mistranslation, something's not translated, or it's a glossary, uh, it's not following the glossary or the, or the translation memory, or non-linguistic where the button is on the, it's aligned incorrectly. Like, let's say it's Arabic or something. Like the arrow is on the right side instead of the left side for a right to left language, you know, things like that. So then it's up to me to take the tickets that are filed by the testers and work with the engineers or the linguists to resolve all the, all the issues. And because Netflix does a lot of testing, there's, there's quite a few issues that, uh, that get filed, uh, for these tests. So. Getting back to automation, I think from a layout standpoint and the non-linguistic issues, for example, truncation, um, things like that, I do think a lot of that could be automated from the flagging standpoint. You know, I think it would be very easy if uh, some machine saw that a string was truncated, you could tell it, okay, if there's truncation, file a ticket, snap a, a screenshot, and send it back over to me. So I, I think a lot of that could be automated. From a linguistic standpoint, I think some things could be automated. Um, mistranslations, if something's not translated, I think that's pretty easy uh, because you say if it's, it's expecting it to be this, then it's if it's not this, um, or if it matches the English source, then it could flag it automatically. But where you start to get into the more nuanced is if it's a, an uncommon translation or if the translation feels weird, where like it's not necessarily the wrong translation, but it's not the best translation. That to me doesn't feel like something that could be automated very easily. Um, so I think from, from a standpoint for, from project management, there's still going to be that need unless you want engineers to uh, actually start dealing with the tickets directly, which they really don't want to. They'd rather just work on what they're working on, code the feature, and if there's problems, I tell them and then they fix it. Um, I still think there's going to be need for a human to manage that process. Um, so, have you ever seen the movie Office Space? 
Are, are, are you familiar with that? With that movie? Okay. Anyways, uh, not to get into it too much, but it's, it, <laughs> there's a scene where there's a guy and he's very much talking about how he takes issues from the customers and brings them to the engineers. And the person interviewing him says, well, what's, what's to stop the customers just bringing their issues straight to the engineers? And he gets very flustered and very upset. Um, because he's, he's kind of a middle person, but he's, he's emphasizing that there needs to be someone in the middle there, um, in order to handle it. Um, and so I very much feel like I'm the, I'm the middle person here trying to, um, prioritize different, uh, tickets, different issues, uh, localization issues that get flagged, uh, and, and making sure they get resolved in, in a timely manner. So. Anyways, really long-winded answer. Automation for project management, yes for some tasks, no for others. Uh, linguistic, yes for some, no for others. I think that's that's probably the answer that uh, that you could give to anything. Right, right, right. That's true. Um, okay, um, let's say 10, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm in, interested in this one. Like, um, What's something that people seem to misunderstand about you? Misunderstand about me? Um... I think sometimes, um, because I'm kind of outgoing, um, that I don't, that I have all the answers and that I'm not anxious about things. And I'm actually a pretty anxious person in general. Uh, I worry a lot, uh, about things, but, uh, I think outwardly my demeanor is, is pretty confident. Um, but I'm not always confident. So I think, I think sometimes people can, uh, cannot really understand that uh, that I'm, I'm actually worried about lots and lots of things <laughs> all the time. Um, but it's, you know, that's the, something that I have to deal with. And uh, But I'll be all right. I'll survive. But uh, yeah, I think that's probably something that uh, people might not understand about me. Is that something you learned on the job or through experience to, to give this impression that you're not anxious and that you're confident? Or where does it come from? If you ever thought of it, <laughs> it's kind of a spot. It's kind of a spiral, actually, because it's, <laughs> you know, you're anxious about lots of things, but you don't want to let people know that you're anxious. So you get more anxious about not letting people know <laughs> that you're anxious. <laughs> and then it's this it's this circle that goes around and around. So, you know, I think um, I feel less anxious and less concerned and more confident when I'm knowledgeable about something. So I think I have a tendency to over, over prepare and get really ready for, for something and really know, um, what I'm talking about. Um, and that, and that helps me overall. Um, and I, I think just doing something over and over again, just being more familiar with it, that, that really helps. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think just, Practice makes perfect, and, and the more I do something, the better I feel about it. How much time did you spend preparing for this interview? Not a lot. <laughs> Man, I was just I was just thinking about it when we started. Like, I'm pretty sure that it, like you told the story that I asked you about like a hundred times. I was thinking like, what would be the one question that nobody has ever asked him? So maybe you can help me. So you've been on a lot of shows. So what is the one thing that people didn't ask you, but you wanted to actually share it with the world, whether it's localization or personal. Yeah. Um, boy, that is a really, that is a really interesting question. Um, Finally. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 you got me. I'm getting real anxious. I'm real anxious over here. <laughs> um, I wanted to share, you know, I, I think and I've, I've probably touched on this a little bit um, here and there um, in, in times that I've talked, but there's this really great, um, I'm not exactly sure what to call it, but it's this, uh, I'm pretty sure it's from Japan, but it's this, it's called Ikigai, and I apologize if I'm, I'm mispronouncing it. Um, ha have you heard of that before? Ikigai, yes, yes. Ikigai, thank you. Um, where it's, you know, what are you passionate about? What are you good at? What can you get paid for? And what's good for the world? Um, and so, you know, I don't always get a chance to bring this up, but I feel like 
the work that I do and particularly localization in general really does fulfill all those things for me. And I think a lot of people that work in the industry, it does, it does fit into, to all four of those tenets of, um, of Ikigai. And so, you know, I don't really get a chance to bring that up a lot. Um, but I do think that the localization in general, if you're, if you're passionate about it, um, can really be something that can, uh, that can fit in with that. So yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, I talk about that every now and then, but, but not as much as I'd like to. So the important part about Ikagai and the one that I think is missing for a lot of people when they think about their job is actually the purpose. Like, does what I'm doing make the world a better place? So how do you think localization makes the world a better place? Because you're reaching more people. You're, you're giving access you're giving access to whatever you're working on to a larger base. You're, you know, we're here in the, the information age, the age of the internet where uh, people have access to information at their, at their fingertips more easily than they ever have in the past. So localization fits right into that. If you make it easier for people to access that information, to learn and to grow localization, like that's, that's what it is. It's making it more accessible. And I really view localization as 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 accessibility being able to have something in in your in your preferred language is is key in order to to learn and grow so yeah i, I think i think that's where the the purpose piece fits in and and it's good for the world uh if more people are able to learn more about whatever they want then then that's a good thing so if this is your your ikigai does it mean that you like see yourself doing this for the rest of your life or do you think like people can have multiple things which check all the four parts of it um i foresee myself working in localization for the rest of my life um or in, in language in in some aspect i've been trying to I, i haven't done so much lately but for a while i was trying to get certified as a, a spanish to english translator um by the the ata the american translator association Uh, that test is really hard. I took, I took a few practice tests. That test is really, really hard. And I didn't, I didn't pass any of the practice. I got close, but I didn't pass any of them. Um, so I, I, I foresee myself working in language and localization, uh, for the rest of, of my life. Um, as long as I'm, I'm, I'm able to, uh, I, I would say for, for other people in localization, if, if your passion is, is language, which I know a lot of people who work in this industry are, then, Keep following that. Yeah. Don't, don't give up on it because you'll find a place that works, whether it's a linguist, whether it's a, a, a project manager on the vendor side or on the client side. Um, there, there is a, 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 a lot of different roles that can, uh, fit different skill sets, um, d- depending on what you're more passionate about. So, um, I, I think there's, there's quite a few ways to fit in here to follow your passion in localization. Do you think that the the current education system is set in a way for people to find their ikagai or no? No. No. I think uh I mean not I'm sure there's certain uh places where that type of uh learning is encouraged. Mm-hmm. But I think particularly here in the United States there's a lot of uh people are are forced to learn in a certain way and they don't have a chance to really follow that particularly early on. You know, in, in college, you can pick your major um, and, and decide what you want to do. But but before that, in, in high school and, and middle school, you really are pretty much everyone learns the same thing and they're 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 forced to to fit in the 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 same box as everybody else when really we should be more flexible like some people are better at math and science and some people are better at literature and, and writing um and on down the line some people are not good at any of those but have other skills so i, I don't think we encourage that nearly enough early on in life to really get uh, to get people i know i know for me i mean i went to college and did not succeed out of high school because i had no idea what i wanted to do um even though i took spanish all through high school you know i i didn't I didn't really understand that that was something that I could continue on because it wasn't really 
uh, taught to me that way. Um, so, um, yeah, I think there could be a lot better job, particularly here in the United States. I can't speak for other places in the world, but here in the United States, I think there could be a lot better way, uh, a lot more attention paid on our early education to really understand or help people understand what they want to be doing in life. Okay, so that's that's the that's the education system. But let's say people are listening to us. So what what would be your advice? How can they find their ikigai? Do do you think it's it's about finding it or it's more about realizing what you're doing right now and trying to fit it into those things? <laughs> Because you know like let's say people who work in localization. I don't think that a lot of them are like super passionate about it. Like many people like just end up in the role. And a lot of people actually like even outside of localization, they just end up in the role straight out of college. And because they have some experience, because they have a certain routine life, they just stick into that industry and stop exploring something else because it would be a risk for them, you know, to try to find what they're really passionate about. Right. Well, I, I think of the four major pieces of Ikigai, um, I think it's i would not say that they're created equal um i would say in order to find what uh in order to find exactly where that fits and to meet all four i think you first need to look at your passion i think if you can find what your passion is first and understand that then that's going to be what's going to lead you down the road because you're going to have to really understand what that is and then try a lot of different ways to implement that. I mean, I remember I remember early on um, trying to understand what what my passions were. Like, uh, you know, I mentioned this to you, like I'm, I'm a huge baseball fan, so I really love baseball. Um, I'm a fan of Spanish language. I'm passionate about Spanish language. And I also... Um, I, I'm not great, but I'm 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 not half bad at, at doing voice impressions. Mm, really? And so for 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 a while, I was like, well, let's see. I like baseball. I like doing voices, and I like Spanish. Maybe I should be like a Spanish uh, baseball commentator, broadcaster, right? You know, and and you know, I, I I tried doing it myself, just like watching a baseball game and commentating it myself, and I'm like, no, that's not really the That's not really fun. I even took I even took like a, a, a class where at a, a voice school where they gave us like um, sample assignments to like pretend to do voices and like actually do auditions and stuff and you get feedback and it wasn't really for me. Um, but, you know, trying to see like what those – what you enjoy and what you're passionate about because I think you'll you'll see like what you enjoy and what you are passionate about are two separate things. Um, You know, you might enjoy doing a lot of things, but you really have maybe just a handful of things, if not just one thing that you're really passionate about. So, um, being able to discover that and then move on to the rest, that's what's really going to lead to enlightenment, fulfillment, um, as the, as the model puts forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how do you go from, from passion to purpose? Whew, it's not always easy. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think not all passions are created equal. I think uh, from a language and localization standpoint, I think it's an easy, an easy bridge to make um, to say that I'm passionate about language. I, if I can make content accessible in other language, in, in that language, then that's going to benefit people and help people. Um, so I think it's, uh, it, it takes work. It takes work to try and, and understand how to, how to do that. Um, but no, I don't really have a great answer other than just to, to be persistent, to stay at it. Um, but you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have all the answers. I'm sorry. I wish I did. <laughs> Life would be a lot easier if I had all the answers. Please don't get anxious. <laughs> So, speaking about industry, my notorious question, what do you think is wrong with our industry? Hmm, that's a good one. <sighs> Maybe not wrong with, with, with it, with, within the industry, but I, I still feel like, and I mentioned this a little bit before, where people conflate internationalization with translation and localization. 
um, where you can't have one without the other and they automatically go together and you shouldn't be thinking about localization or translation without without being international or having an international presence. I think you you very much can see growth and and drive um, new business by having uh, a multilingual experience within any given uh, country. So that's something that I came up with against a, a lot um, uh, at Lyft when trying to convince higher ups that that it was it was something we needed to do. So I think that's. It's not always clear. It's not always clear that there is value in in just um, localizing as opposed to launching internationally. Um, I think there's way, way too many translation vendors. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like, I don't know, I get these messages from lots of people and there's just so many. There's so many of them. Like, can't they just like... I don't know, like group together and make it like everyone work together. I know that's a terrible thing. I shouldn't, I should not say that. Maybe you can just cut that out. <laughs> no, th- 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 that's actually a good point because I went to my very first lock launch. I don't know, maybe more than a month ago, the San Diego one. And one of the guys, I think he works for Transperfect. He asked the question like, you know, like, because recently, like there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions so he was asking like, will there eventually be just like a few big players and all the small pills will die? So that would ha- work for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's more just having to s- sift through it all. And, you know, I, but do you actually have to like, why? I don't No. Yeah. I personally don't. Um, you know, there's there's a separate team for that at at Netflix um, that just deals with vendor management, and there's several different vendors that Netflix works with, depending on the content and the and the language um, and and quality measures. Uh, they're constantly rotating in and out. So no, I I don't have to deal with that. I just it's more just I see the amount of people that contact me and. It's just, it's, it's a little overwhelming at times. Um, so uh, maybe if everybody just, just grouped together, um, and, and, uh, and made one, not, not one, but you know, like a handful of, of big ones. But I think it's a valid question that, to ask, you know, eventually are there going to be, is it just going to be a, a handful of players? Um, and it might be, but it might not. I, I didn't respond during the lock launch because it was my first lock launch and maybe I was a little bit anxious like <laughs> like you, you know, because I'm a, I'm a little bit um, anxious maybe around a lot of strangers that I don't know, especially if I think that they know each other very well and they're like a tight group and I'm like, a, you know, like an outsider. But to me, from my experience, I'm not sure what is your experience, I'm not saying this is a rule, but like a lot of the big players, they lose on the innovation. To me, like that is like where the smaller players could maybe give you like a more personal touch and maybe drive the innovation because the big players are more about economies of scale and they just keep doing the same things over and over again. I don't know. Yeah, I I would say if you're looking for a more personal... um face-to-face type interaction, then I, I do think a, a smaller player would be the way to go because they're going to have fewer clients and be able to, to focus more time on on you. Um, if you've got a, such a large program where that's just not possible, then then the larger player is, is, is going to be right. But, um, you know, I, I think if you, if you really want to get uh the voice right and and that's not to say the larger players can't do this yeah. but i think um it's it's a lot more work to do it um at a at a scale like uh like an uber or a netflix you know you know once you're that size how do you maintain that so and i don't think a small a small player could could do that so you know i take it back i think both i i think i think they both can serve a purpose um, it really depends on what what the client wants and needs, and at what scale they uh, they're currently at. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had this question. So, you know, like when all these people contact you, and to me, look like it's kind of annoying to you. <laughs> a little, a, a little. 
<laughs> so what what do you think would be like a strategy that, w- that would work on you like how would how how yeah yeah like how would they stand out how would they capture your attention um let's see because there are quite a few people you know i think looking for doing the research and not just because i feel like a lot of the messages are pretty generic copy paste yeah uh on like hey i do like our company or i do this and this and this how can we work together um it might be better to like personalize those messages a little bit or at the very least instead of saying hey can we meet together or, or, or can we meet and try and figure out how to work together say just are you the right person i just feel like a lot of people just assume that like i'm the person and i think that comes from the copy paste so i think if you're you know don't don't make assumptions just because someone works for a, a certain company that they're the right person to to ask so um being being more curious and asking more questions instead of saying all right hire me say like hey are you the right person to even talk to to get hired um because i'm not so <laughs> i'm not the right person um but uh i certainly have public resources that i can point people to um there's there's a couple of public sites where uh translation vendors and linguists can apply to to be considered um and i'm happy to share that information and i want to pass that along um so and and i do on a regular basis yes i i know what we're going to do like i'm going to cut the part where you say i'm not the one and we're just going to post it on linkedin like to all localization vendors this is a message from zuck don't you dare <laughs> well i'm doing it as a service for you right okay all right whatever whatever you say <laughs> Um, yeah, w- what I wanted to make a point was that, you know, like when, when they contact you with this information, to me, it like shows that they don't know what they're doing because like they, they can pre- pretty much f- like either imagine that a company of Netflix and the size of the program would have a vendor management a team, which would be better to contact which then tells me that, okay, if you cannot do this research and how can you, I don't know, let's say research how we communicate to our customers as Netflix or something like that. So exactly right. You nailed it. I'm pretty sure you, uh, we, I don't mind naming because we already named them <laughs> when I was doing interview with Jan Hendricks, you know, the yeah, Jan. So we were mentioning that he, he was complaining about one particular agency in Asia, a CCJK or something like that. And they also contact me like, and all of the people, they just add me and immediately they just do copy paste. And even the project managers, the vendors managers, all the same things. So I'm pretty sure they must have reached you as well. They have. <laughs> and I, I don't know if I responded, but I, that's those, those letters sound very familiar. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure they've, they've contacted me at, at some point. Um, so. One more question, and maybe I can, I'll, I'll let you pick. So, because usually people struggle with these questions. So, there's the question, things I change my mind about. So, something, let, let's say, for a long time, you thought that this is how it's supposed to be done, and then something happened, like either you talked to someone, or you had an experience, or you read something, and then you're like, oh, I was wrong all the time. Or the second thing is absurd or stupid things that you do absurd or stupid things that i do which means that most of the people on the earth would say like dude are you serious but for you it's normal i could probably answer both of those pretty quickly um things that i changed my mind about um i think i definitely when i first got into localization i felt like a more centralized approach was the only way to do things um, and I think that was something that I, I got from being an, a, a part of a small team uh, at the beginning at Lyft and then an even smaller team of being just me was that everything needed to run through me um, or, or the, the localization team in order to be successful. And I think some centralization is, is important, but building tools and 
processes to empower other people at, at the company to handle it on their own. And yes, setting up checks and balances, um, along the way is, is fine. But I think in the beginning, I was like, no, I have to do everything. Everything has to go through me. When in reality, that's just not, not possible. It's not feasible. Um, so I, I really had to, to change my perspective to say, no, it's okay to let people engage with, with me for localization requests. But set them up for success and then let them run with it as opposed to doing everything myself. So that was something that I had to, I had to kind of change my perspective on. Um, something absurd. Uh, I watch the show, The Office, which used to be on Netflix, not anymore in, in the United States. The US one? The US one. I have probably watched that show from beginning to end. Hundreds of times, maybe, th- maybe thousands. Um, it's tough. I, I don't know. And I, I haven't counted, but I literally used to just watch it like as background, uh, like white noise, go to sleep if I was going to sleep and just have it on constantly. And so I, I've probably watched that, that show more than the vast majority of the population. I know it's, it's a very popular show. So I'm sure there's someone out there that's watched it more than me. But uh, I wouldn't like to meet them because they're probably crazy like I am. <laughs> um, so that's something that uh, that I do. And I still watch it. I still watch it, even though it's not on Netflix. Uh, I, I bought it on iTunes before it went off um, off of sale. So now I can I can still watch it whenever I want. So, you know, probably quote most of the show all the way through. I've played a handful of office trivia. I've done done pretty well on that. But uh that's that's a show that I've watched way more than the normal person, uh, but to me, it's just just how I roll. Do you have Funko Pop of someone from the office? I don't. The, you know, I'm not big into Funko Pops. Uh, the reason why I got the one behind me was the Dodgers won the World Series this year um, or last year, and it was the first time they had won since 1988. So it had been quite a long time. So I bought quite a few Dodger pieces of memorabilia. And this was one that was, uh, I got it for a good price. So, um, I figured I'd, I'd snag it, but no, this is the only Funko pop that, uh, that I have. Who was your favorite person from the office? Favorite character from the office. Whew. That's, that's an interesting one. Um, I think maybe, you know, he's, he's more of a bit role player. Um, but Moe's Dwight's, Dwight's cousin, his his weird cousin, and and mainly because I mean in the scenes that he was in, he's just so weird. But also that that actor Michael Schur was a writer and a producer on the show and did a lot of the um, a lot of the jokes and a lot of the success that The Office had was because of Michael Schur. I mean, he also did uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine. He was a, a producer and writer on that show as well, and and a few other ones that I can't remember right now, but. I think just uh, the fact that he was he was so talented to be able to to be that weird character Dwight's cousin and be such a a brilliant writer I think definitely makes him probably probably one of my favorites for sure. Was there anyone who made you angry or irritated? Ugh, I hate Angela. I hate her. I mean, and that and and that says that says something because I think you know Angela Angela Kinsey um, who uh, who who's the actress. That's just something that she's really good. Like the fact that I had this reaction about her, like tells me that she's a really good actress. And in real life, you know, she's a total sweetheart. Um, but, you know, I always like she just always kind of graded on me. And I just wasn't I wasn't a, a huge fan of her. And that was her character. And that was really what she was supposed to do. Um, and she succeeded. So I think, you know, from a, from an acting standpoint, she was she was great. But no, I did not did not enjoy her character at all. For me, it was the, the receptionist. She wasn't there all, all the seasons, you know, the, the, the very naive one. Mm, Aaron. Yeah. Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, she, she had the show on Netflix, uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Yeah. Um, that's even worse. <laughs> you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a huge, a huge fan of that. Albeit, you know, I didn't, I didn't watch uh, a ton of episodes. Um, why can't I remember her name right now? Um, Ellie Kemper um, was the name of the actress. Uh, 
you know, um, she had her moments, um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I I thought she was pretty good. I was a fan. Yeah. Um, okay, Zach. So I think that will be it for this interview. Now, not yet. Um, <laughs> almost. Almost there. Um, final words, if you could speak to the minds of everyone in the localization industry, what would you tell them? Yeah, I think I already said this, but uh, just to wrap it all up in a, in a few sentences is um, no matter what you're doing or what, what the skill set you have is, if you're passionate about it, no matter what your background, no matter what job you're working if you want to break into tech, if you want to break into localization and you have the passion, you, you, you can do it. There are avenues and opportunities. And I think that really comes from building connections and building relationships with people. Um, and every single person I've met for the most part in localization is willing and receptive to help people along the way. So I would say, don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Because um, you might not always succeed, but if you continue to do it, then you will be successful. So don't be afraid to uh, to really move forward if this is something you're passionate about. Yes, be confident. Don't be anxious. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, Zach. Awesome. Speak to you next time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. See ya. <laughs>